it's an exciting moment in mathematical mathematics, mathematics research, and in mathematics teaching. And uh, I will actually manage to mention at least a little bit of my own work or my own research on this topic. It's about uh, the, how mathematics and artificial intelligence interact. So I, I will try to give you a taste of things. I'm, I'm not gonna, I don't plan to be very technical. I, my, my intention today is to try to be uh, very provocative. I, I would like to, to try to push you to think about how computers are becoming more and more connected to mathematics. I mean, we all already know for, for a long time that mathematics and computers are connected, but I want to uh, think that in the future, this is gonna be even more true. And uh, anyway, so the, 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 the new results are work, joint work with my graduate students uh, that are listed here, and you can download some of these papers already from the archive. So let's let's go to the. So let me start by just thinking a little bit about what is what is artificial intelligence. Well, so I was looking for some kind of definition on the on the literature. So I was looking at the Brookings Institute, which is a think tank. And they have this interesting definition, which I think is very appropriate for, for what I'm going to talk about. So you have a collection of software and algorithms that make decisions that normally would have been made by human level expertise. So you have an expert and you ask the expert, make a decision for me. You get a veterinarian and you ask them about your cow, right? So that's, that's the kind of thing that, that you would like to replace a human. The decisions that a human, human used to make, well, now you would like them to be made by an algorithm, okay? Now, uh, as you probably have been, if you, unless you have been living in a cave for the last uh, five years, you, you are realizing that artificial intelligence is changing a lot of things in our life. And uh, so let me just quickly run through some examples. So the, the, main, uh, the main example to me right now is healthcare. We have a lot of activity in the area of healthcare because the large amounts of data that healthcare generates. For example, here is one of my favorite examples. There's a, there's a company in Germany, Merantix, which is specializing on trying to do diagnostic of medical imaging. And so, for example, if you are trying to detect uh, lesions on leaf nodes, this, is, uh, this can be done through CT scans that normally human, a human radiologist or a specialist will, will analyze these images and, and tell you, oh yeah, there's a, there's a lesion here, there's a problem in this in these uh, cells. And you know, it costs you say $100 an hour for this person to do it. Okay, that's very expensive because they can only do it slowly, right? They can only do it very slowly. They're humans, they get tired. So you can do say four images an hour, that's what they say. And, uh, but then if you think about it, when you, you want to prevent these certain cancers, you want to do diagnostic for thousands of people, right? Or maybe millions of people. We want all be diagnosed to be preventing cancer. So you want to do say 10,000 images. Imagine the cost that that's gonna be, and even more, more, more important, the time that it's gonna take if you do it by humans. So what these, what these uh, engineers are doing is they are, the, the, they build out metatics. So they're using methods from machine learning, so artificial intelligence to detect uh, irregular shape limbs or, or things that can be uh, problematic, right? So, and they get to be very good. I mean, the, the accuracy is incredible. That's, that's one example already that is very important. Another example that uh, I recently came into contact is in the city of Cincinnati, the fire department gets about 80,000 requests per year. So they get phone calls and they have to make a split second decision of what should we do with this uh, call? You know, should we take, take this patient to the uh, prepare, it, prepare it for a medical emergency to take it to the emergency room, or is this something that is routine that can be treated on site? So essentially you, you need to make very quick decisions and humans can make a lot of mistakes and they, they forget how the decisions are supposed to be made. So, because we get tired, right? Humans get tired. But if you have an artificial intelligence system, it can be more consistent, it can be large, it can handle large amounts of, of data. So you, you can handle, essentially a lot of calls and you can be more consistent because you can use the history and, and you have all this information collected uh, inside. So that's another a very interesting example, so how, how, how the services are changing. I mean, I don't need to tell you about self-driving cars, but, uh, but in fact, I mean, there's more than self-driving cars, right? In some sense, 
even you when you are driving, we know the Teslas, I mean, they can detect other Teslas. I mean, there's all kinds of information that cars can start sharing and then they can start uh, improving, for example, congestion. If you have information about congestion, you can change the route automatically or you can be suggested to change the route. Uh, information about the conditions of the road, et cetera. No? So that's, that's uh, I mean, finance is, is also quickly becoming very inf inf influenced by, by artificial intelligence. And um, of course, there are some issues that are very ethical issues on this, of course. I don't want to, I don't want to forget to say that there's a lot of important changes that influence humanity, right? So for example, decisions about loans now can be taken by algorithms sometimes, you know, by looking at, at the information of the, of the borrower and things like that that used to be just done by a human with a credit score, a background check that was simple, no? So there are also automatic advisors that can create your personalized investment portfolio now. I mean, they can suggest portfolios to you. And of course, trading. Trading is becoming essentially, the, with high frequency trading, you can do very, very, very quick trades uh, online, no? And that's used done by computer. I mean, one of my favorite ones, I, I was speaking to somebody in Wall Street the other day that was doing fraud detection. I thought that was very cool because they can actually, uh, by looking at sifting through data, they can find patterns in the data that, that seem to be illegal or they seem to be strange much more easily. And so they can identify abnormal, abnormalities and outliers. So that, that's an important change. All right, so the last one is of course about uh, cybersecurity. Um, the, the US military is actively looking into how to use uh, the machine learning on security. And so there's a, there's a project called Project Maven that essentially is trying to look at software and try to find information on software. So they have been able to stop actually cyber security attacks, cyber attacks uh, by these, these two computer viruses. So they, they recognize essentially pieces of code by sifting quickly through the code, they can recognize pieces of code that can be viruses. Anyway, so, so in other, in other, the punchline is of all this, uh, the uh, artificial intelligence is everywhere. So the, the big question I want to put to you is, how about mathematics? How, is mathematics such a pure science that is completely immune to artificial intelligence? So I want to, in the rest of my time today, I want to talk to you about the answer to this because artificial intelligence can integrate information in new ways. So what artificial intelligence can do is we can integrate information, analyze data, and then help us make decisions. And so my punchline today is artificial intelligence needs mathematics because artificial intelligence is founded over mathematics. So without mathematics, artificial intelligence will not exist. But not only that, I claim that mathematics can use artificial intelligence too. So I would like to, to show you two quick examples of that. So in the first part, I will show you how geometry is, can influence artificial intelligence. And so my main message there will be uh, how geometry, combinatorial geometry matters for statistical learning and estimation. So I will make a, a short example of how can, you, how can you use geometry, the basic of, of geometry uh, in, in, let's say, in uh, low dimensions even, to understand uh, how to make decisions, how to separate data. And then in the second, at the end of my talk, I will talk about how artificial intelligence can help on, with algebra. So how can you help to make uh, algorithms in algebra faster? So I will give an example of that. And so that's the plan for the talk. Please stop me if there are any questions, you can put things on the chat. I will try to, if I can, I can follow, uh, stop every now and then and see what, if there are questions on the chat, okay? So just, uh, or, or Sunil, you can send it to Sunil. Uh, if you are shy and you want, don't wanna put your name, you can send it to Sunil and Sunil will, will let me know. All right, so that's the plan and let's get going. So, our, so machine learning. So I'm gonna tell you the fundamental problem of machine learning. You're given pictures of dogs and muffins. And here are some pictures of dogs and muffins, right? So I challenge you, can you recognize, a, uh, can you tell apart a dog from a muffin? It gets pretty hard as you can tell, right? Just look at these two guys, right? Muffins and, and, and chihuahuas are very, very alike. 
So uh, the question is, can you teach a machine to do that? Can you teach a machine to recognize? And as you know, I mean, if you have been following the news, we can do that very fast and efficiently now with, with neural networks. So uh, what are the principles behind this? I will argue that the principles behind this is all geometry. So let me explain to you how it goes. So you have these pictures, right? You have these pictures and these pictures, each of them is represented by a matrix of pixels, right? So this, uh, so you have the, the pixels, you, they give you a matrix. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess if you, if you think of this matrix, it depends on the size of the picture, but it, it re every pixel represents the color or the intensity of the, of the, of the color. But the point is that in some sense, these are high dimensional vectors in some high dimensional space. Okay, so for me, these are points in space. So, so you see muffins and you see dogs, but really I'm working in our N, in some N dimensional space. So these are vectors in some N di high dimensional space. So, so the plan is to use mathematical analysis to find a function that separates, that can, that can separate the dogs from the muffins, right? So that you, you're gonna find a multivariate function that will separate the two types of data points. Yeah, there's two classes of points and I'm gonna separate them, all right? So, so let's, let's go. So yeah, again, so my data, my data points are the images, which are high dimensional vectors. And I need to find what I call a classifier function. Yeah, what's a classifier function? Well, it's one that is gonna be, if I give you a, a muffin or sorry, if I give you a dog, it's gonna be positive, but if I give you a muffin, it's gonna be negative, all right? So you can imagine that my, I have my, well, I have a nice picture next. Here is, here are my muffins, you know, and here are the dogs. And my separator will be in this example, this line. But sometimes separators have to be more complicated functions like this, right? So you would like to have a, a function that uh, that is going to... So now, now uh, what I'm describing right now is what we call training uh, supervised learning, because I give you data points that I know the answer. So, you know, maybe Tom tells me muffin, muffin, you know, he tells me several pictures, gave me several, the answers for several pictures. So, so I, I ask an expert to tell me labels. So the, so I have the data, X, so the XI represent the pictures. So XI are the pictures and the YI are the labels. So that tells me it's a one for a dog or a minus one for a muffin, all right? Are you with me? So I'm just putting red and blue. You can think of this, you know, if you don't like zero and one, just think of the, the dogs are blue and the, the muffins are red, right? So it depends. You Now, this function, I mean, there's, I have so many, infinitely many functions to choose from. So how do I choose a function? Well, the, it's a very simple principle like we teach in calculus, right? You have to find the maximum of some, some function. So I have what I call an error function. So the error function makes sure that I know how far, how far I'm, uh, how grown I am in the predictions. So I'm making predictions. And every time I make a prediction, did I get it right or I get it wrong, right? So- yes, There's a question. Yes. So um, in, in regard to what you just said, is, is it, can we guarantee that it will either be right or wrong or is there a zero value that we have to worry about? Well, actually in some situations, we don't get it right for sure. So, the, so often we are wrong, right? When we are making a prediction. Uh, at the beginning, what we're given is data that is completely correct. We can trust this data. This is what we call the training data. So that was given to us by an expert and we can trust that that is completely accurate. But using this training data, I'm gonna find an objective, I'm gonna find a function, which is the, this error function. I will give you an example of this error function in a moment, which somehow quantifies how wrong have my predictions been, okay? After I make the training, so first I train, then I, um, then I make predictions and I, I start comparing. The function f, the classifier function, is gonna be the minimizer of this error function, okay? And I will show you a moment in a moment the, an example. By the way, sometimes, um, yeah, so let's, let's go to this example. So what's the simplest kind of function that we teach undergraduates? Well, 
lines, planes, right? So we, we know the equation of a plane looks something like you have A1, oh, so let me use here. So the, the typical equation of a plane, so remember Xi, Xi is the vector, the, the, is the picture, right? So it's, it's one of the pictures, picture number I. Yeah, it's, it's the ith picture that I have. So I can do the multiplication. So let's say that this picture has D, 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 D pixels. So this, uh, so Xi lives in RD because there are D pixels, D pixels. Okay, in that picture. So now what is a plane gonna be looking, looking there? Well, it's gonna be of the form W1 X I1 plus W2 dot X I2 plus da 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 W D uh, X I D less than or let's say equals to beta. Yeah, that's the equation of a plane. It's a linear equation. Uh, the coefficients of these linear equations are W1, W2, WD, and beta, right? The right-hand side is beta. Let me make it cleaner here. So that's the equation of a plane that will that presumably will separate my data, right? That will presumably separate my data. Now, remember, I don't know W1, W2, WD. So the mystery here, so the big question is who who are, you know, the W, W, I, the W, I's, right? So who are, who are the coefficients of this mysterious hyperplane? This is the hyperplane I'm trying to find out here, right? That, that will separate my data, right? So, so how do I do that? Well, it's a system of equations now, right? Because if I plug in all my points, so, so for example, maybe you gave me, you are the expert and you gave me I don't know, 20,000 pictures of muffins and 20,000 pictures of dogs. And you told me these are dogs, these are, these are muffins. Then I, I can solve this system of equations and figure out what W is, at least approximately, right? I can use least squares, for example. I mean, we teach undergraduates least squares in linear algebra and we can use that and we can find this, this hyperplane. Are you with me? So I'm explaining the principle of the classifier function by using a hyperplane, just a plain vanilla hyperplane. And of course, even there, there's beautiful geometry already. So you can ask me, for example, when is it possible to separate blue from red with a hyperplane, with a straight line, with a straight hyperplane? When is that possible? Clearly, here is not possible, right? This, this other example shows you that not always, you know, not always you can separate. Yeah, not always you can separate with planes. But there's a beautiful theorem that I really, really like to teach to undergraduates when I teach convex geometry that says, if you have red points and you have blue points and you wish to know when they can be separated by a hyperplane, you know, by a straight hyperplane, a flat, a flat hyperplane, not wiggly, not, not, not wiggly like this one, but you want a, a flat thing, then uh, this is gonna happen if you just check you are in D dimensions, remember? D dimensions is, the, is the, the number of pixels in your picture. So then what you need to do is take D plus two pictures, you, know, you take D plus two pictures, you know, you take any D plus two pictures and if they can be separated by a, by a hyperplane, then you can separate all the collection by a hyperplane, okay? That's a very famous theorem, Kishberger theorem. And uh, so that shows you the principle of, um, are there any questions of how this is this is in a, in a big level how the classification of pictures works in in Google Docs? I mean, when you play with Google, you, they tell you pictures of dogs and all this. You can, or or how Facebook right recognizes your face uh, from other faces. So the question uh, in the chat is about the the classification function. So so uh, is it ever zero? Is 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 the the worry? Is the classifier function ever zero? Um, well, we make it in such a way that it's not gonna it's not gonna be zero, because um, how can I say? We always have data for which is positive, right? For example, I always have uh, here. If I look at these blue points, well, I know for sure there's at least one positive point, and I know for sure there's at least one negative point. So, so you know that it it doesn't become totally constant zero ever. Okay. 
So what can happen is that the, the, the function that you find is pretty bad. For example, if I'm trying to separate with a plane, so what, what will be the plane that separates this data here? Well, the answer I'm gonna get is terrible, right? It's gonna be terrible. So I don't know, maybe the plane is something like this. Oh, sorry, it looks like this. So obviously makes, puts a red, a muffin in the side of the dogs and puts some dogs in the side of the muffin. That can happen, that you get, you get ground classification in some sense, right? That can happen. But you don't get a zero function. Okay, so now one of the most popular ways to do it, okay, separating with a hyperplane was too easy, right? So separating with a simple hyperplane was too easy. So sometimes you want to have a little bit more complicated functions. You, you want the hyperplane at least to be more complicated because you want to account for, for the... So as I mentioned before, here, you might have some inaccuracy, right? You, you, you have a hyperplane, but you want to have uh, some, some, um, some, free, some freedom to make mistakes. You want some freedom to make mistakes. You cannot expect that the data will be completely separable. So, but you want to minimize the mistakes. So the probability that you, you make a mistake is, is reduced, is minimized. So, in machine learning, people use what this is called the logistic function. This is called this function is called the logistic function. And you can see that what I do is essentially the idea of the hyperplane, but I use a more complicated function to optimize. So here you see right here. Let me just actually uh, highlight it in a different way. Let me use a different color here. So you see here is here is a separating hyperplane. The, remember the w the w is what you're trying to find out the xi is the data right the xi are the data so you if you try to minimize the w so the w's are the variables you're minimizing you're minimizing a function and and you're trying to find a minimizer the way we teach in multivariate calculus right you compute the derivative and you try to find the the you know when the derivative is zero to find the the, the maximum now this function is very nice it you know it's because it's a convex function and we can actually do the optimization. In fact, the, the, one of the reasons we like this function so much in applications is because there's an interpretation. Uh, so you imagine that you choose a W and a beta. You found the answer for the maximizer. So then you can interpret for a, for a data point. So, so the X, you remember X and Y are, is a particular data point. It's a, it's a picture X with a label Y, yeah? And I can compute this quantity and that's a probability. I can think of this as the probability that I got the correct, the, the, what's the, the probability that I got one or minus one? That is a dog or a muffin, okay? So then it's very easy. I can predict the label. So you, you can make a prediction of, the, of a label by computing probabilities. You can just compute the probability that X is equal to one or that X is equal to minus one. And you choose the, pro, you choose the label that gives you the highest probability. That's how we do it in, in, in practice in some sense. And this is a pretty popular method. It's used everywhere that there's two class, classification in two classes. Are there any questions about this? This is called logistic regression. So many people call this logistic regression. All right. Okay, so now I wanna to talk to you about logistic regression with many, many, many pictures. So imagine I'm trying to recognize my friends like you, like Facebook does for you, right? So then I have pictures of Tom, I have pictures of Sunil, I have pictures of Jennifer, you know, I have pictures of Brett, I have pictures of myself, I have pictures of many, many people, right? And then I try to make a classification. I, I want to say, oh, you know, this person is, but you, as you can see, you know, I don't know if you can see this very well, but you know, there's this, these two people, I mean, this is the same person, right? Just making a different expression. And the classifier thinks it's two different people, right? So if I look, now look at the other side, you can see that the, the classifier thinks it's two, two different people. So, so that's, that's the kind of thing that I'm interested in right now. So what I use is what I will call is a multi-class logistic regression. So it's a generalization. It's a generalization of the idea that I explained before to, to many colors, so when I have more than two colors, okay? Now, are you with me so far? This is what I'm gonna talk to you for the next 10 minutes or so. 
So multi-class logistic regression, because you know we don't want to classify just vanilla and chocolate. We we want we want many labels. We we want many flavors, right? So that's the reality. And uh, so there are many algorithms uh, to do that. Um, so again, just as as I was doing before, xi represents the data. These are the pictures, and the yi are the labels. So now remember, now I have I have m labels. I have m labels because I have M, M color classes, right? It's the pictures of Sunil, the pictures of Jesus, the pictures of Tom and Jennifer, et cetera. No? So I have all these pictures. Now, I'm not gonna go into details because these are technical and it's not so much more different than what I explained before, but there's a, there's a logistic regression for M colors. There's a logistic regression formula for M colors. So in that case, um, so the logistic regression formula tells you the probability that you should assign the, the, the label S to the data point XI. So you have a picture XI and you want to assign certain label is given by this formula. Essentially, this is the, the same probability that we saw before, but because now you have M colors, we need to modify the, the logistic regression. And here, this is essentially the same that I had W transpose beta, right? These are the coefficients that I used before in the previous slide. Uh, these are the, what I, if you ask a statistician in a statistics, people call these regression coefficients, right? So I'm doing the, the regression analysis here. And uh, so, and I, what I need to do to find the best coefficients, I need to solve the maximum likelihood estimator, which was the logistic regression that I saw before. Now, this is the generalization. So just trust me, this is the same thing as, as I saw for two colors. I explained that for two colors. Now this works for M colors in general with some simple modification, but it's the same kind of function with a logarithm. And that's why some people call this the log likelihood or, or in the statistics terms, this is the maximum likelihood esti estimator. All right. So that sounds great, right? That sounds great. Now that's what we use in practice. If you ask a lot of people, this, that's what they do. They do multi-class logistic regression. They, they use logistic regression all the time. That's fa a favorite of many uh, statisticians, for example. That's great, except that you don't know when the maximum likelihood estimator is going to exist. I mean, if, you, if you're a mathematician, you say, well, is there, a no is there a maximum? I mean, we ask undergraduates when we teach calculus. Sometimes there's no maximum, right? There's no minima, so sometimes there are only inflection points, right? So what's going on with this function? We don't understand this function necessarily, but uh, it was observed in the, in the 1980s, already in the 1980s, these people observed that the maximum likelihood does not always exist, unfortunately, yeah? So that's a big problem, right? I mean, you have all these people using this method I mean, without any, without, with, I mean, it's, they're using the method illegally in some sense, right? Because they are not, they, they don't know whether the optimal solution will exist. There might not be a, there might not be a function that finds, uh, that, that gives you an optimum solution, right? So that's, that's what we did in our research. We started thinking about this problem. How can we solve this problem? And that's where geometry comes in the pictures. I mean, basic combinatorial geometry, basic geometry of points and lines. Are you with me so far? Okay, so let me explain to you what this geometry says. So it turns out that the, that the logistic regression is gonna have a solution precisely when you look at the red points, remember you have red points and blue points. Let's say in the case of two colors first, in the case of two colors, you have the, the red points and the blue points. And what you would like to happen is that the, the convex holes of the blue points intersect the convex holes of the red points. So what does that mean? So you, so what that means is you have some red points and then you have some blue points. So the convex hole is the smallest, the smallest polytope, the smallest convex set that contains these, these points. In this case, it will be this hexagon, I guess, well, it's more like a, more like a pentagon. And in this other case, the convex hole looks like this, right? So you see, imagine that you have a rubber band, you have a rubber band and you have a bunch of nails 
And you let the rubber band go. So you're asking for what's the, where does the rubber band get stuck, right? Where does the rubber band get stuck? So it's the smallest convex set. So that this, the convex hole is the, is the intersection of all convex sets that contain the, the, these points. So the convex hole is just the smallest uh, convex set. containing these points, okay? Let me show you some other pictures. I have some interesting pictures to show you. Here's, here's some pictures. So there's a very famous data set that classifies uh, uh, handwritten digits. So when you send a, a letter in the US Post Service, your handwriting needs to be read by a machine, right? It's not read by humans most of the time, it's mostly read by, by machines. But machines need to recognize your handwriting. My handwriting is awful, so I'm, I feel sorry for the machines, right? So the machines need to recognize these pictures. And here I'm showing you essentially the data for the, for the zeros, the six, the fours, the number ones, the number sevens, etc. You can see them here projected into two dimensions. So here you can imagine, so for example, if I look at the blue points, let's look at the blue points. Uh, here are some blue points and I can find the convex hull of the blue points, right? The, the convex hull of the blue points is something like this. Here are all the blue points containing this, this shape, which is the smallest convex body that contains it, right? So you can, you can think of this as, this is the limit where the blue points exist. This is kind of the, the, the region where the, the blue points exist. And you have a similar region for the red points, right? You have a similar region for the red points. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the red point region. So if these two regions don't overlap, then the, the, the logistic regression does not exist. Yeah, that's the problem. That's the catch here. So, so are you with me? So there's a geometric explanation when there is a solution for this function or not. There's a geometric explanation for this. I have so, a quick question. Yes. Can you explain the scale of the two graphs, please? The scale of the two graphs. Yeah. Um, well, these are, okay, sure. I can explain it. So these are, so remember these are pictures. For example, if I draw the number nine with by hand, you can think of this as a picture that is 200 by 200 pixels. So this is a, a picture in, in dimension 200 square, right? So what you see in this, in this image is just the projection in the two dimensional plane, because obviously I, I have not been able to ever draw 200 dimensions in, on, on the screen. So I'm just drawing a two dimensional projection of a, of a four, you know, 200 square dimensional vector space. Yeah, so I'm just projecting these points. And you know, the coordinates are here just the sizes of, this, of these coordinates, right? For example, you, you know, the pixels are between, I guess in this case, the pixel entry, if you look at a particular pixel, uh, you know, it goes between 30 to minus 30 intensity, I guess is the color of red, how red it is or how blue it is. So that's, that's what it means. Uh, I will say in some sense, the, 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 I'll say the scale is not so relevant in the sense that I, can, I could have chosen a different projection for you, right? I'm just choosing this projection at random. It's, it's, not, it's not relevant, okay? What about for the second one? Uh, same thing, same thing. Okay. Yeah, same thing. I'm just projecting, taking a random projection of the pixels, essentially, of, of, the, of the pictures, which are made of pixels. So we, one coordinate equal, equals one pixel. So these are, you know, the range of the coordinates of that pixel. So... And the choice of pixels that I made is, is, is kind of irrelevant. I mean, the, this other picture I'm showing to show you the convex holes, right? The, the, the smallest polygons that contain those pictures, okay? Of pictures of the same color, of the same class. Ah, okay, so yeah, so okay. So, but for practical purposes, what I need to do is I need to explain how much training data do I need to sample a function? Do I need to sample before I can expect that the, that the, the maximum likelihood estimator will actually exist? If I sample too few, too few pictures, for example, if, if you only give me a few pictures of, of dogs, let's say you only give me five pictures of dogs, 
but 20,000 pictures of muffins, my classification is going to be very poor, right? You understand, right? So the, the quality of the classification depends of how, how many points you give me that are well distributed, that you are sampling from this uh, space of data. And you would like to understand how, like, how, many, how many of these sample points I would like to see before I can finally make a decision that is correct. Yeah, for example, if I only give you the, the one picture of a dog and 20,000 pictures of muffins, you're going to think that dogs don't exist, right? Pretty much. So when you are doing artificial intelligence, it's not very different than when you have a little baby and you want to show pictures of cats and you say, kitty, 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 kitty. But if you show the, the kid only pictures of cats, that the first time that that kid sees a dog, is going to think, oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a cat, right? Has four legs. If it is the first time it sees a, a dog, he's going to think that that's, that's a cat because all his life he has only been seeing cats. Are you with me? So this, the size of the sample, the size of the data set needs to be inform, informative before you can actually make conclusions, right? So that was, that was what we, so, okay. Uh, let me tell you first the answer for two colors. We, we did the solution, we wrote a paper uh, for Siam Data Science, uh, journal, journal of Data Science, where we find the answer for, uh, for M colors, for many, many colors. But let's, let me explain to you what happens for two colors first. Uh, so imagine you pick N points at random from this distribution. So in this, imagine you're picking muffins or, do, or, or chihuahuas, muffins or chihuahuas. Right? So that's what you're sampling here. And uh, so then some of them are going to be red, and some of them are going to be blue. And it's not an unreasonable assumption that you should at, at least expect that they have equal probability. So with equal probability, one half, you, it's like tossing a coin. You're tossing a coin and you hope that the, it's, you know, with equal probability, you're going to get head or tail. With equal probability, you get a muffin or a chihuahua, right? Okay, so what will be the probability that if you do that, you, the, the, the red points, the convex hull of the red points are going to intersect the convex hull of the blue points. So it turns out that we, we know that the, the answer to this probabilistic question, which is very beautiful, right? So you, you are sampling points. So imagine, I mean, just to, so you understand the, 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 the geometric situation. Let me make a picture. So you have, for example, imagine that you have a, a circle and inside this circle, you're sampling either blue points, which are the, the dogs, right? The, the dogs. When you're sampling, uh, let's say, let me use red, red points, which are the muffins. And then the question is, what, how likely is or how, that you are going to, as you sample more and more points, that the convex holes are going to intersect. And th in this case, the intersection will be, so this is the, the, the convex hole of the red points is a triangle, and the convex hole of the blue points is, uh, is this shape that is more like a, like a pentagon, right? So in this case, they intersect already, but how many times do you need to sample with, if you, if you let the number of samples go to infinity, you, you're sampling, 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 what do you expect to see? All right, are you with me? So that's the question. And, and one can answer this question. So in 1964, Thomas Cover, uh, that's his name, Thomas Cover. So he, he found the answer. So he, he calculated the exact probability that, that, the, that they will intersect, okay? So, and then, so that you can, if you do calculus, I mean, you can do this as a, as a, as an exam, in an exam for calculus, what's the limit when n goes to infinity? You know, when the limit, when n goes to infinity, this goes to zero. Sorry, it goes to one, goes to one. So that the probability that they will intersect as n goes to infinity is, is, is one. All right. So that was Scover's theorem. So that's great because then we can use the maximum likelihood estimator, right? In, in dimension two. Um, yeah, let me just briefly say, how many points do you need to sample? Well, roughly you need to sample uh, about twice as many as the number of pixels you have. So if the no remember, D is the number of pixels, D is the, the dimension of the space. So that's the number of pixels you have. Uh, that's uh, roughly uh, twice as many points you need to sample to get, to get the, the separating property. Okay, but... We want to generalize to many colors, right? We want to do this for many, many colors. And we did it. So we, we figured out what happens when you have many colors. So we get a, a, a generalization of, 
of, of covers theorem that, that was joint work with my student, um, uh, Tommy Hogan, who's working now for doing data science for Hollywood, actually. So I don't know exactly what he's doing with Hollywood, but I know he was hired by Hollywood to do data science for them, for I guess for movie selection or something. Uh, anyway, so he, he, he proved in his PhD thesis a generalization of covers theorem that says that when you have n colors again, so he, he was able to prove if you have n colors, you, now you have not just muffins and dogs, maybe you have cats and cows and all kinds of other animals. Uh, then uh, the probability that that you that, that you have an intersection. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say here. So I say that we say that, that there's a terminology that I'm, that we use that when when the colors intersect. So in other words, when there's overlap of the colors, we say that a partition of endpoints into is twelve when the convex holes intersect. So you have the color red, and the color blue, and the color green and the color yellow, say, you know. And all of them need to intersect. There's a, there's a common intersection here, right? There's a common intersection right here. All of them intersect. That's when we say we have a Twerberg intersection. And that's great, because if we have a Twerberg intersection, then the maximum likelihood estimator exists. So we, we generalize Cover's theorem. And, uh, and in fact, we can tell you how many points you need to sample. So if you have them colors, well, you need to sample at least uh, roughly this many, this many points to make it work. So it's, it's a function that depends on the number of colors. The more colors you, you have, the more animals you are, you are trying to de distinguish the pictures of many different animals. Obviously, you're going to need to sample more, uh, more colors, more, more points, more data. You need more pictures, right, to, to learn. If you, for example, again, if you have never seen a, a cow, but I give you pictures of dogs, pigs, and, and chickens, the first time you see a, a, a cow, you're gonna think it's a it's a it's a pig, you no? Know? So you you don't know because you have never seen it. Yeah, you need to see enough cows, you need to see enough pigs to know what's going on, right? Okay, are there any questions about this so far? Let me. Um, uh, I don't want to run over. Uh, so I have about ten minutes left, right, Sunil? Just to check. Um, you, you can feel free to go um, go uh, five minutes past twelve. That's that's fine. Okay, great. Yeah. Wait, so quickly in regards to like um, being Turberg and there existing a maximum likelihood estimator. So let's say, for example, if the partitions aren't Turberg, ter verb, um, mm -hmm. if they're not that, does um, the maximum likelihood estimator not exist or yeah. is it unknown? It does, it may not exist. So in that case, it's is it often it doesn't exist, but it may not even exist. Yeah, we, it may exist, but you don't know. You don't know for sure it will exist. So it's a, it's an issue to, to be completely sure of your analysis, right? Your analysis may be faulty. If you don't have so, in, in other words, the message is that if you don't have sufficiently many points, your analysis with the maximum likelihood estimator will be will be incorrect, and therefore. You need geometry to, to know how, how, how many points you need to sample. That's essentially what I'm saying here. Yeah. That's my first message. Okay. So if, you, if you're ready, I'm going to switch the, to the next message, actually. Well, I, I think I want to use my last minutes to talk about a, a different question. So if you didn't follow the first part, I want to talk about a different question. Can, we do arti can, can machines do mathematics? Is there such a thing as artificial mathematics? You know, we talk about artificial intelligence. Can, can there be in the future artificial mathematics? There are some mathematicians that think that's definitely true. I'm, I want to take a little bit different, different point of view. Um, so I want to talk about mathematicians. We generate data, tons and tons of data. I mean, if I just... Uh, Pick your, pick your favorite area of mathematics. And I guarantee you that in that area of mathematics, there's a way to generate data that you can explore with machine learning, with artificial intelligence. So for example, in geometry, I generate a lot of data. Just by randomly generated objects, mathematical objects, and, and I can look how they behave, right? 
So the question that I want to understand is what can be learned from math, about math just by looking at the data? And can we use this data to do something useful? For example, can we use this to prove theorems, right? So, so I have been working a lot in, in algebra, so especially algebra related to polynomials, algebraic geometry, and uh, I'm interested to recognize properties of algebraic objects. So I would like to recognize algebraic properties. Uh, I will give you an example in a moment, an example that undergraduates can understand uh, of algebraic properties that are, that are really, really recognizable, okay? And that an undergraduate has a hard time in recognizing. So, so let's see. Uh, so the second question is, can we make artificial intelligence help mathematical algorithms? Can we improve mathematical algorithms using artificial intelligence? So in some sense, can a computer learn to make better algorithmic choices? So one thing we teach in, 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 uh, in class sometimes is that in some algorithms we have choices, right? Uh, so maybe we're choosing the right, uh, the right uh, order the, of the variables or we're choosing some particular parameter of the algorithm to make it faster or, or slower, okay? So mathematicians, we make decisions that are a little bit human decisions. We make them a little bit arbitrarily, but machines can make these decisions more rigorous, okay? So in some sense, my message is that I will use data science to improve mathematical algorithms, right? So I wanna briefly talk about neural networks. I mean, in some sense, one way to think about neural networks is again, you have a family of functions that approximate the data that you have. So you think of the data. So before I was talking about, remember I was talking about the, 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 the hyperplane WT, right? That this is a separating hyperplane. So now I have parameters, it's a, it's a family of parameters that is parameterized by functions that are compositions of functions. I mean, we teach students in calculus how to compose functions, the composition of functions. And here we're composing very simple functions uh, that, come, that are given to you by a, by a network. Essentially in each node of the network, you have a linear function and then you apply a simple nonlinear function. For example, maybe you, you apply something that looks like, like this. It's a nonlinear function that looks like a, like a blip, like a, you know, like in a, it's a bit, yes or no, right? It's yes or no. Or you apply something that looks like this. So the function is, is, is linear, it's quasi-linear, I mean, it's, it's broken into two pieces, linear pieces. So, but the composition of very simple functions, and you are trying to find the best, the, the, the function on, on this parameter space that minimizes the error, the minimizes the error of the data, just like we were doing in the case of the logistic regression. So you're, you have a family of functions and you're trying to find the best function, the, the optimal function that minimizes the, the bad predictions, right? You, because again, you have the training data, and, the, and then you test it, you test, the, you test with the data, and then you see how many times you got the mistake. What you really want to minimize, the minimizer, is minimizing the mistakes. That's what gives you the classifier function that I told you before. Now, in the neural networks, we have many more parameters, and the structure of the network, as you see, is like a, gra it's a graph theory structure, allows you to do... Um, you know, allows you to do more complicated functions. You, you, it allows you to, 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 to live in a parameterization space much more rich. I gave you the logistic regression example, but this is more, more you know, it's a, it's a larger family of functions that we can do with neural networks, okay? So in the rest of my talk, I'm gonna use, instead of logistic regression, I'm gonna use, um, I'm gonna use uh, neural networks to do everything. So, so let's talk about uh, a problem that undergraduates, we teach undergraduates in, in algebra and in calculus. So we often tell an undergraduate, okay, here's a polynomial. For example, I'm giving you this polynomial right here. And if I ask you how many complex roots are there in this polynomial, all the undergraduates will say six, right? 
But if I, if I tell you how many real roots are there for this polynomial, I think uh, everybody will agree with me that, well, well it's, they're going to say, well, it depends, right? It depends uh, who P6, P5, P, yes, uh, you know, wh who these coefficients are. So it depends on these coefficients. And it's a dependence that is very sophisticated. I think uh, the number of real roots can be zero or it can be six, right? It can be all the, all the way from zero to six. And there are many techniques we teach undergraduates to try to find out the real roots. And you know, we factorize, we teach factorization of polynomials. Okay, so what if I take a, a machine learning algorithm and I just, I, I teach a machine to, 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 to count real roots just the way I teach little kids between, to differentiate between a cat and a dog. You know, to, to teach a kid between cats and dogs, I, I say, show the kid pictures of kitties and dogs, right? I have dog, kitty, 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 dog, 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 etc. cetera, no? So here I'm just showing many, many examples to the machine of real roots. That's what I'm doing. I'm just showing them examples of real roots. So essentially, I'm doing machine learning and the, the neural network has these parameters, right? The parameters are the, the coefficients and the machine learning is supposed to, the, the artificial intelligence is supposed to know how to tell uh, whether it's a, it's a it's, uh, how many real roots are there, okay? So we gave, we gave data to this problem, right? So we, I took, for example, several polynomials of degree four, six, with zero real roots with, uh, so I took a thousand of this. Then I took a thousand of this kind. For example, these are polynomials of degree five with exactly one real root. I also took, uh, you know, a thousand examples of, of uh, polynomials of degree five with exactly three real, three real roots, etc. No, So I do all these calculations. And now I have my machine learning. I have my artificial, my machine is, has learned everything, right? Has learned everything. So, the results are surprising. So undergraduates have a hard time dealing with this. So now I give them an, a, a polynomial. Is it, how many real roots are there, right? Well, machines are, are really great. So, so, so what I'm showing here is the, the number of real roots here are, are listed. And then I say, well, how many were predicted, right? So every time I get it right, I put a point in the diagonal. So if there's a, if, if I get it right, I put I put a mark in the diagonal. So as you can see, the diagonal gets marked constantly, right? It's like duh, 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 duh. so you get, that's why it's, you see it's so dark because I always get it right. You know, I just get it right completely all the time. I you know I have a few errors. Obviously, I have errors around. You know, the the, the most difficult cases is when I have four real roots, essentially. Uh, between three and four real roots. That's what makes really the most difficult cases, but I'm still getting it more than 80% of the time I get it right. So my machine will get an, a, a B plus or an A minus on the exam for sure, right? And I didn't do anything fancy. I just asked my undergraduates to implement this. They did it in one afternoon and it, it just beats anything else, okay? So, I mean, I don't mean to scare you, but I think we can teach machines to do all kinds of things in mathematics. So just to conclude, uh, so another thing that we did with, to teach uh, machines in the last uh, two minutes, right? I have two, three, two minutes left. Um, so there is, there's a problem in logic, it's called the satisfiability problem. So the satisfiability problem is you are giving a, a, a logical statement and you are trying to see whether the, if you put true or false, zero or one values to the variables, then the entire statement is true. For example, so I have here a statement, you know, x1 or x2. This is the negative of x1 and this is the negative of x2. I need to see whether I can make this statement true or false. For example, if I put uh, x1, oh, sorry. Let me do it this way, x1, oh, x1 equals one, x2 equals zero, x3 equals zero, x4 equals zero. Yeah, so I make essentially true, false, 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 false. Then you can check that this will be, so this one will be true. This one will be true. 
this one will be true and this one will be true okay so uh the result is that i made a, i found an assignment that works but finding these assignments is complicated you have to look at a search for all many possibilities you know these are all the possibilities to make the assignment of true or false for these variables, okay? So I'm doing binary ar arithmetic. In binary arithmetic, you know, one plus one plus is equal to zero, right? That's what I'm doing here. All right, so these formulas, um, everybody wants to know how to do it because it has many applications and there's many algorithms to do it, but we want to compare these algorithms, right? We want to choose the best algorithm for our problems. So what people know is that the, the algorithm you choose gives you a different answer depending on the problem. So the, the, the community of researchers wants to find the best, the best algorithm and they even have a competition. Yeah, they even have a competition. More than 30 solvers compete every year on trying to, to find the best solvers. Okay, sorry. Uh, so the, so the, the, mass, the, the punchline is that artificial intelligence can help you with this. So, so there is uh, the traditional method is you can measure the runtime and compare, you know, all the examples against each other with the and then then take the average. So you run you run your 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 solver on a benchmark on a benchmark of problems, and then you look pick the the one that does the best on average or has the best median or something like that. That's how people do it in practice right now, but with machine learning with machine learning. I can use a solver that chooses the best solver for my problem, the best solver for my data, yeah, for my instance. So in 2007, they found something called Satsila. I mean, if you guys have heard of Godzilla, right? The big monster, the king of monsters. Well, this is the king of solvers. So this is an intelligent, an intelligent solver because it, it chooses the best solver for my problem every single time by using artificial intelligence. Okay, and using this idea, you can speed up mathematics. Many al mathematics algorithms where there are decisions to be made can be sped up. So let me just conclude by saying that, uh, yeah, so you, you can do um, you can do the same thing in algebra. So I, 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 we did it in algebra, in polynomial algebra, and also we did it in, in optimization algorithms. So we can speed up algorithms by using arti artificial intelligence. All right, so I'm... I'm I one minute over, so let me just say thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you, and thank you for your time. Let's thank Dr. De Laura, De Laura please, uh, by putting something in the chat, say clap, reaction, clap on camera, however you want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and we will open up for questions. <laughs> so I think Jennifer has a question. Yes, so it's just one of the things that we I uh, talk about when we teach um, elementary statistics is uh, a linear regression. And one of the things we say is, you know, you should try to fit it with a line if the data doesn't look at least vaguely linear. Uh, but it, the linear methods are much easier mathematically. So we talk about transforming the data if it's exponential, if it has some kind of curve in it, that we can straighten out the data and then we can use those linear methods. So when you were talking about your linear separators, is, is it also possible to, do, to, to transform the data so that you can use, so that you can find linear separators where, where before it wasn't possible? Yeah, thanks for your question. That's a, that's a very nice question because let me show you. So let's go back to this picture. So for example, yes. So, so here I have this example here where, where the, clearly the data cannot be linearly separated, right? Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right that if you, if you, for example, imagine that you take the red points and you put them one higher dimension, right? Mm -hmm. So in other words, you put the blue points in one plane and the, the red points in another plane, right? And Just now by you can separate them. So then you can separate them, right? Because mm -hmm. you are, they are in different different parallel hyperplanes in some sense, right? So yeah, so what the trick that many people use, they call it kernel methods. Yeah, so, the, so by using kernel methods, mm -hmm. they, can, they can transform the data essentially 
to make it more am amenable to, to a linear separability problem. Uh -huh. So that, that is certainly the case. And, uh, and there's a whole bunch of research on, on how to best do the kernel methods, how to separate, how to transform your data to, to, to find the right shape of the data, right? So that you can use linear separators. Essentially, yes, because linear separators are, I mean, the, the beautiful thing about linear separators is we, we understand them better. We, as you said, we can compute better with linear things. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Sure. So there's a question from the from uh, that someone sent in chat. Um, can you use the uh, the information and the algorithms and the machine learning that you had for the real roots uh, sort of topic um, to learn about Galois groups associated to those polynomials? Oh yeah, I um, mean there's certainly people that have been interested on predicting, you know, what the Galois group should be for a for a particular equation. You can do all kinds. So the 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 sky is the limit of what one can do with <laughs> machine learning you can try to teach a computer anything right so so that's this is essentially uh, i think it's an exciting time and and a lot of experimentation can happen very interesting experimentation and by the way it forces you to think about mathematics as well right the foundations of mathematics need to be adapted to apply these methods somehow right so what's the just like uh, when hilbert invented the ideas of, you know, existential proofs. I mean, a lot of the things that, that we think of proof right now were not ideas of proof all the time. So the, the idea of proof, mathematical proof has evolved over the, over the years. And I think now is the time that we need to start evolving as well. Okay. Jesus, with no. regard to the finding the, uh, the number of real roots, how well does Descartes' law of sign do for a starter? No, the, the, the Descartes rule of signs uh, gives you an upper bounds and, and predicts sometimes it's incorrect, it's incorrectly, right? So, no, so just so just doing that is not is not helpful. But what what we guess is happening here is that somehow the the machine discovered the Descartes rule of signs <laughs> because the Descartes rule of signs is not perfect, but it makes it's it's almost perfect, right? It, let's say. Most of the e instances that you can think of, you will get it right with the car rule of science. So, so it's like, uh, you know, you have a, a smart undergraduate that figures out that the car rule of science and is just using that all the time. And many times he, that undergrad is correct, right? So. so can I ask a question? Eric Rodden here. I, I, so we tried, I'm a knot guy, and so we were trying to see if we could take pictures of knots and have, um, have it predict a knot type. And we used ones that were polygons so that we could uh, restrict it so there weren't a lot of knots there or a lot of different choices. And when we did, you know, it really has to do with like what's crossing over what and, 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 uh, and, Basically, we couldn't ever get it to really work. What, what it could figure out is that some knot types, because we were using not many edges, tend to be more spread out. The unknots were spread out, and the other ones were like, um, you know, more compact. And so if it was compact, it'd be like unknot. And if it was, or it was not, you know, and then it would, it couldn't figure out chiralities and stuff like that. Uh, so I guess my question is just kind of in general, are there, uh, is there an understanding of like what problems the neural networks can deal with well and what sorts of problems are just not, or are we just not clever enough about the information we're giving them? I mean, my answer will be that at this point, we don't know. You give me a math problem, like the, for, for example, the polynomials, it's a little bit obvious what you should try because you only have the coefficients, right? The coefficients of the polynomials is obvious. You need to use the coefficients. But in the case of knot theory, there's so many other possible features you could use. There's other characteristics of the, of the info, there's other data, data features that you can use. Mm -hmm. So it is, an, it is right now an art, not a science, to know what, is the right, what are the right features you need to use to, to make predictions efficiently. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but particularly with pictures, is is there any understanding of of what sorts of no, not really. I mean, of the pictures is you know I it can pick out and what it can't. 
No, that's one of the reasons deep, you, you may have heard in the news, deep learning, deep learning, deep learning. And so people know that if they use a, a neural network with large number of, uh, with large number of, of layers of the network, I mean, things seem to work very well, but they don't understand why and they don't know how many. I mean, right now we are in the wild west, essentially, of machine learning for understanding. I mean, what they call it, exp um, there's no explanation. We know it works, but we don't know why it works. And, and and in the case of pictures in particular, they're trying to say, well, why does, how did, how did it tell between a dog and a cat? I mean, what, what's going on there? What's the essential information that you're using? And when they're going back to analyze these complicated functions, it's very difficult. You cannot see really what's going on um, because there's so many, so many variables and there's so many it's high dimensional spaces. It's very, very complicated. Thank you. Let's please thank uh, Dr. DeLore again and uh, um, by clapping or putting something in the reactions or whatever. Thank you so much.